Right. Um, I will start with a video, so I think that... This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Yeah, that's a fabulous uh, piece of animation by a group based out of Stockholm who are asking us to brand it with the ISDE. Uh, they want to see this thing going viral. They want to see this, everybody in the world to see that piece. But it sets in place the uh, really, you know, the, obviously the Anthropocene, but you know, Digital Earth is the most critical project underway on this planet at this point in time. One interesting question, and again picking up from t what Tim was presenting, is just when you look at just how many people have lived on, the w on Earth, and you were looking about the Anthropocene period, you know, it's 57 billion is one of the estimates, and uh, it's effectively the number of people today on the planet, in the planet today, it's, it's like we're one in eight of all the people who've ever lived on this planet. So you can look at over that sort of very long period of time of you know, 200,000 years, that we are starting to strain this planet at its seams. We're certainly having a massive impact as be, that has been spoken about by other sort of speakers there. One of the other interesting things is that uh, basically it took 200,000 years, or 190,000 of those 200,000 years, for the world's population to equal the population of New Zealand, a country that we call small, compared to with many of the other 20 nations that you're all from here. And so this growth has been very sudden, very much a burst. This is a picture of Wellington. This is all New Zealand trying to look like a big nation, but this is a marvellous photograph that was taken back in 1931 showing deep passion about election night. One of the other things that we're seeing now is that there's a you know, massive amount of information that's been captured. I took this off The uh, Economist uh, a couple of years ago, and obviously we've gone off the end of the forecast now. It's going up at <laughs> exponential rates here. But you know, one of the things, when you look at all the people that have lived, it's like when we're keeping information, it's not just about information about the moment, it's the information about the past as well. So there's a phenomenal amount of data that's coming through. 
once upon a time, particularly when you look at 3D data or also 2D data, it was all crafted. What we're now entering is a period where that data comes in as deluge. You're talking about LIDAR, you're talking about you know, terrestrial LIDAR, other sorts of forms of data, as well as all the remote sensing and imaging that many of you are involved with. And yeah, this data is coming in at breakneck pace, plus also the sensor webs and everything else. And uh, it's you know, saying before, it's not just about today, it's about the past. And it was raised uh, yesterday was about the importance about that whole persistence of data and the preservation of data and the challenges that we have with that are challenges that we haven't yet quite adequately resolved. This is an image that shows uh, some of the satellites around the planet. I think there's a bit of artistic sort of merit in that, but it, you know, that's been spoken about yesterday, is that you know, we've got lots of different sources of where this data is coming from. I know with terrestrial LIDAR, some work that we're doing with NICTA in Australia, they're bringing in 10 million uh, points per second just as they drive down the streets. So we're talking about phenomenal amounts of data coming through. One of the heroes of the, of the story is Ptolemy. Ptolemy, we could probably consider as the grandfather of digital Earth. And I just love this quote of his, you know, this is 2,000 years ago. So Ptolemy was a Roman citizen. He wrote in Greek, uh, but he lived in Egypt. And he said, you know, to present the known world as one and continuous and to describe its nature and position for almost a, a theme or a, a goal for what digital Earth's about. And again, you know, geography came out of this as sort of a, an idea that could help sort of you know, enable this, this, this vision that Ptolemy had. Um, Tim Forsman mentioned about Buckminster Fuller, a visionary in the 21st century, an extraordinary man. And he came up with this idea of a geoscope. And again, this is in, you know, during the Second World War. But a way that if we could put a, a geoscope together that sort of represented the planet, uh, this would be a way that we could sort of help stop some of the hostilities, we'd get a better understanding of ourselves. And as Richard McGeorge was talking about before, you know, looking at some of the social aspects and things like that, starting to really understand one another in a far more sort of communicative way. And we've spoken quite a bit about Al Gore, who in 1998 gave his famous uh, paper. And uh, again, looking at this, this thing that we have, um, islands of opportunity amid oceans of information chaos. Again, those, those, those oceans are getting much, much bigger. And you know, we've landed man on the moon, but we now must understand our footing on Earth. And again, you know, there's a huge amount of collective intelligence on this planet and how we can be bringing this together in a constructive way to do something extraordinary. And I was very impressed with the, the, uh, the youth uh, sort of discussions yesterday about looking at the differences between 2006 and today. And again, looking at the idea of networking and sort of the importance of open sourcing and looking at ways that, that we can be far more communicative. There's the paper that a number of us here uh, contributed to that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, although we didn't talk specifically about uh, spatial, spatial, <laughs> placial <laughs> technology, which is something that Mike Goodchild has been talking about recently. But I'll be talking a little bit about going from space to place as we, as we talk this through. An interesting map, I collect old maps, and this is one that I have on my collection. This is about 1850, yeah, 1570, I should say, and it's by a fellow called Ortelius, and he was an early map maker based in uh, the Netherlands, in, uh, in Amsterdam. And he spoke to a fellow who's a Je Jesuit called uh, Babuda. And Babuda wandered around Asia and started looking at things and started bringing information back to him, and so he would collect this information and put it into a map. And so when you look at this information there, if you look at this map, this help may help a little bit, you've got Malaysia off to the left, <laughs> you've got China below, you've got the Silk Route wandering up north, and you've got Japan, it's, uh, for kui -san here, <laughs> you won't recognise your country there, <laughs> and the Philippines and, and things like that at the side there. But you know, it's, it's really bringing that experience back and then presenting it on a piece of paper that you could then share with others. This is far, far the, uh, part of the first atlas that was ever produced. He also showed a bit of a social element in it with Titanic wagon dwellers as they, they moved themselves around sort of the, the deserts near Beijing. I don't know if Guo Hedong still sees these things today, but I'm sure it's a thing of the past. But a, a friend of Ortalius was Bosch, who was a famous artist. Now I've put this one in here, but it's really when we start looking at the way we plan cities now, 
It's very much like what medicine was like in the medieval days. You can have <laughs> brain surgery, but you know, at these stages they really didn't understand uh, the circuitry system or the endocrine system or the other different sort of complexities about sort of you know, uh, how our body worked. And you know, it's you know, the other examples of when you're putting wasps in jars and curing rheumatoid arthritis. You know, it's this gaga that is going on now with a lot of the planning that we have today. And uh, you know, this is where this evidential sort of data sets that we can produce and manage and collate together in digital earth is going to become absolutely critical because we're going to be moving planning from medieval stages into modern information society. What's happened is really a major step, was really when you look at Ortelius' work and then you look at uh, Hondius, or particularly with, around Mercator, Mercator came up with effectively a filing system in, uh, on maps, so putting this Cartesian coordinates in place you could start reassembling it. So grabbing some of the material from uh, Ortelius and starting to put it on a grid. So if you struck a rock somewhere, <laughs> you, you would sort of stop people from striking. If you saw a sea dragon somewhere, you'd know where those sea dragons were. And so it's, it's bringing all this information into a structured way. And so really effectively what we're talking about, Digital Earth is really revisiting this again, but taking this into that multi-dimensional form. As Richard McGeorge, McGeorge was talking about, you know, the five Ds. I mean, so sort of bringing all these other dimensions together and seeing it. One of the, the great heroes of New Zealand history from a European perspective is James Cook. And uh, yeah, he did these wonderful maps. This is a Bailey Cook map. My wife gave me one of those. She bought at auction for my 40th birthday. And uh, you know, it's the first facsimile effect for just showing what New Zealand was like. But he, he had the benefit of Harrison's chronometer. And again, starting to use this modern technology. And again, history's repeating. I mean, we've got the earlier presentations that were shown. Peter Woodgate was talking about GPS, and we're, we're moving towards getting millimeter accuracy in the next probably 20, 30 years with GPS. And uh, five millimeter. <laughs> five years, there we go. It's much faster than I'm saying. So this is happening at breakneck pace <laughs> going forward. But do you start looking at sort of the benefits that took place basically with the chronometer and the quality of data that was collected to there? Here's another map I've got in my collection. This shows Auckland. It's, it's showing sort of a, a waterfront that no longer exists. It's all been reclaimed. And you've got sort of a, you know, a three-dimensional map here. And you can zoom into this map and you can start seeing people crossing the street as it was back then. And uh, I can sort of zoom in a bit here. And this is looking at around the Auckland domain, which is where Auckland was formed. So in July 1840, a domain was established. And this is actually, I should brag, being from Auckland, but the, in between 1840 and 1860, uh, Auckland was the capital of New Zealand. It's no longer. <laughs> Wellington is very much the capital of New Zealand now, but uh, this is basically a park that was set up. But they used the path of streams to create this, this park. And, uh, and again, these streams have been lost. They, they exist into the stormwater systems and things like that. So we don't know where those streams are today, or we do know, but they, they don't exist on the surface. And so they've been lost. But uh, some work I did a number of years ago, uh, we went off and sort of looked at uh, georeferencing early satellite uh, some aerial uh, maps with some of the early maps and starting to relocate those streams, looking at the, sort of the, the parcel boundaries of these properties and sort of seeing them georeferenced onto these early maps. So other work I was involved with with Auckland is looking at the sunlight performance controls and Simon Fernihuff's here, he was working on this one as well. We set up a company in, called Cadabra in the 80s. It was one of the first companies in New Zealand to build its own 3D technology. And uh, as a consequence of looking at every moment of the year where the sun was and looking at areas where it's protecting the sun from 11 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon and other parks, there were 27 sunlight controls. We generated this envelope that would comply to everything and then rendered it as a stained glass window. And uh, so you could see where buildings would breach this or not. And then you could start looking at the sort of the, the rights to light, if you like, throughout it. This had a big impact because it, then it shaped the, the shape that we have of Auckland today, which is not as bad as a shapely city as world cities go. We had a, little, a big boom in the 90s after we did this, and it brought into sort of this, this, this shape. Around about the same time, we were involved with initiating a project that's known as Sky Tower. <laughs> it was a bit of an ugly looking rendering, but this is one of the very first images that we did when we were starting to locate it. We put it on a site, those of you that know Auckland, is Upper Simon Street. But we had big issues with what was called the E10 view shaft, which is from Mount Eden through to the northern part of the Harbour Bridge. And so uh, after we, we went through the Town and, planning, planning, Town and Country Planning Act, and we went back through appeal, 
we got turned down, so we needed to go back and relocate it to another site. And so our tower at the time was looking like this, so it's very similar to the tower today sitting at the top, but we had a, a very elegant tripod with glazed tripod as the part of it. We worked with a group called Webb Zarafa Menkes Houston out of Toronto. They'd just previously designed the CN Tower in Toronto and a group of architects, HBO. And uh, it, we used the CN Tower as our prototype to build this at least we did so until about 93 when we had a bit of a disgruntled argument with the, uh, the developers and they changed architects and so Gordon Muller finished the tower off. But he took our designs and then sort of made them more affordable. But I'll be talking a little bit about sort of planning there. There's the comparison of the two towers, but you've got, I shouldn't be so cynical, but it's like the sewer pipe that goes up the tower versus our elegant tripod that we had back then. But it was more affordable. This, this comes back into discussions and I think Simon Lloyd Evans talk tomorrow is the importance of consenting sort of processes and starting to look at more efficient things because a lot of great, great thoughts and ideas get dropped off because of the longevity of a lot of the, the planning processes. Things just fall by the wayside, they get too hard to do. So around about 91, yeah this is 91, uh, with Cadabra we went off and we were approached by the Singapore government and we worked with a company called Intergraph in the States and we built a, the very first prototype uh, to look at automated building code compliance. So looking at this consenting, so we basically took out a topology of a three-dimensional CAD model, they were quite primitive in those days, and then we would then publish it, interpret it in this prolog, which is a, a programming language, but we could structure it into that, push it through a portal, run it against an induction engine, and see if it would comply with the fire code or not, and come back with error messages. So it's very much turning the architect effectively into a visual programmer. And so I won't take Simon's thunder away, but you're going to see pretty exciting things tomorrow in his keynote. But uh, we are with BIM in the BIM world today, which has come along since, is you're looking at you know, different standards such as IFC, and so you've got far more interoperability being spoken about, which is enabling these, this sort of type of testing to be done far more effectively. And again, in the digital, digital earth sort of world, if you want to be bringing both the built environment as well as the building inv information models together, so you're bringing the natural and the built environments together, fusing it together to see things properly. So if you're looking at rising damp and you're looking at other issues, you know, to really understanding this, the building stock and again, reflecting on Richard McGeorge's presentation before, if we're going to do it properly, we've got to look at things in a holistic way and start you know, just not separating things into silos. A number of years ago with a bunch of friends, we went off and we were sitting around having a beer <laughs> And we just felt that the fellow who was the mayor of Auckland at the time, uh, John Banks, was doing the wrong things. And uh, we um, decided, we didn't like this idea of a big motorway going through a bay that uh, was in Parnell where I live. And so we sat together and we thought, well, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, we did a computer graphics image as, of, as accurately as we could show what this motorway would look like. And then after that, um, we ended up on the front page of the New Zealand Herald. Uh, we did it as a cloudy day because it wasn't sort of a particularly bright future that we saw. We had a bit of a yellow tinge on the side. I don't know if you can see that on there, but uh, we were criticised for the yellow tinge. But uh, this is a big motorway that we, we decided that shouldn't go ahead. So we were encouraged to set up our own political party, which is very much community roots. None of us had any affiliation with the central government party, but we all had a passion for the city and the passion for its future. And so we put this together. None of us had ambitions to be career politicians as such, but we were just went to. Anyway, we ended up getting elected and came in with a landslide victory and pushed about change. So this is back in 2004. <laughs> so we, one of the changes we brought in was the Digital Earth Summit into Auckland. Another thing that I was thinking about that stage, and I was made chair of transport, which was a, a, if you ever want a job where you get more hate mail than anybody else in the country, <laughs> that's a great job to have. So I was Chair of Transport for Auckland for three years and uh, we decided we'd just go off and actually increase congestion and put in, um, you know, make it far more convenient to use public transport. We pushed very hard for the electrification of rail and we also pushed for the amalgamation of Auckland from eight cities into one because basically, you know, pollution and other things, you, you know, boundaries. And uh, you know, these, these weren't all necessarily all very popular things but they've happened. And so we got it going forward. This is another initiative, and I'm showing you the National Party view. We've got a, one with a red light for the Labour Party. <laughs> and uh, this is the Anzac Centenary Bridge, and I think Rachel might come up later on and show you an interactive one of this. But uh, this is an idea of taking out the old Harbour Bridge that we've got, which Auckland sort of identifies with, and put it up as, a, as a, an icon to the love affair of the private car, and put a three-kilometre bridge that will allow sort of uh, can, you know, light rail and other things to cross it. 
So some other sections of it there, but sort of doing something that would be world class. So when you're talking about computer graphics, I showed you before a vision of the future that we didn't want, but also communicating a vision for the future that, that we may want and showing bold futures. So getting these discussions going forward. And then also saying, well, wouldn't it be amazing if basically, we, because the idea that we've got there is just purely a straw man concept, but you could get people blogging and communicating in there, so the effect would be creating briefs by open collaboration with, with wide audiences of pe people and creating like a 3D wiki to go forward and start talking about futures. Again, in that period there, we had the Digital Earth Summit, which was, we're very proud of, great success, and, and changed a lot of thinking in a lot of in different ways that we couldn't have, have anticipated. But uh, Helen Clark gave a very good uh, presentation, an opening presentation at it. We had a very strong youth group that was involved with it as well. Then the America's Cup was around the same time, and with a colleague, it's, uh, Mark Thomas set up a company called Right Hemisphere. And uh, basically from the America's Cup doing visualizations and simulations, that he then took it to Boeing, knocking on the door of Boeing, and then built Boeing using this as a post-CAD forum for dealing with massive data sets. So you've got the 777 here, and this is a 27 terabyte data set that you're publishing data in and out of, and the software was neutral to the different file formats. So if you're designing the windscreen wiper for that aircraft, you'd go in there, you'd pull it in and use it in, say, SolidWorks, and then publish it back into it. When you published it back into it, it then would generate this you know, computational fluid dynamics or the meshes for it and create multiple derivatives that come from it as well as animations. And so we then took that with Nextspace. Nextspace was established as a partnership with the government as a catalyst for 3D visualization. Said, look, if this works for the aerospace, why can't it work with looking at building better cities? And so we've been looking for a city to, that we can build and working with Melbourne very much in, in taking that forward and some work with Auckland. But you know, when you look at 3D visualizations you know, versus the 2D, you know, it's got a number of benefits and again, very much part of what we're seeing with the, the digital earth vision. I mean, it's obvious with, with communication, we can reduce considerable ambiguity and the presentations that Ian Taylor and, and Richard showed before are good examples of that. There's also what's very important, this is what we found from the work we were doing in Melbourne with Southeast Water, is looking at the validation, calibration completeness. So when you're blurring the physical and digital worlds together, you can see what's missing. If you're stuck in a cartographic paradigm, you're not gonna see the things that are gonna be missing. It's also very powerful for visual navigation. This is why SAP went off and acquired Right Hemisphere at the end of last year, because they saw this as very powerful to be visualizing this ape spatial type data sets. So if you're looking at titanium bolts that were put together by Tim Forsman on the aircraft, you can then go off and just, just ghost those out and see it. What's well, also very important for us learning because we can then be mapping knowledge, semantically mapping knowledge onto 3D objects and you can see how things can be developed and going forward. With Carlo Ratti's talk talking about sense, sensor webs and sensibility, you know, sensible cities, uh, looking at sentient infrastructure and sentient cities, so alive and self-aware cities, and really having 3D becomes very much the operating system for these types of cities as we move forward, where we're sort of coordinating between the spatially where the sensors are. Then we talk about simulation and output, and there's been a lot of discussion about inundation modeling and things like that. You really need to have a robust 3D model for it. But probably what's very important that's picking up sort of the themes that I was talking about earlier is more and more raw data is coming in in 3D. So we're getting LiDAR, we're getting sort of these UAVs or nano quadcopters. That, you know, basically, it's going to be a drone for every home in five years. <laughs> but uh, we're going to get this vast amount of data that's going to be coming through. This is some work that we're doing involved with the Institute of Earth Science and Engineering looking at um, you know, this deep borehole seismology, bringing in sort of data sets that are coming from that. There's some work that we did with the Institute of Earth Science and Engineering looking at some of these earthquakes around Christchurch and putting 3 to the Mayor of Auckland and the Vice Chancellor of Auckland University looking at it there. But also in, in the area of BIM that's coming together, so we've got the sort of the geospatial world where many of us have been involved with meeting the sort of the built environment. And again, they talk about multiple dimensions. So Richard had his 5D there. They talk about, I don't necessarily agree with the way that the BIM world views, but they're sort of building upon each, each step. They're more or less like Lego blocks rather than dimensions in my world, but you're sort of adding the time, it's 4D, you're adding the cost, they call 5D. You're adding the sort of the project life cycle, they're calling 6D. They're now adding the sort of the, the whole building life cycle, so the whole, what they call the carbon footprint of the building. And when now they're talking about 8D is bringing a whole construction safety. In essence, in the digital earth world, in fact, in Perth, we're talking 5D about the evidential aspect of the data sets, which is becoming increasingly important in this. And so, I mean, it's bringing this sort of terminology together. I've got this most fascinating project, and I think Keith Thorson's here somewhere, uh, with the National Library. 
and we've got this uh, exhibition that's opening on the 26th of November. It'll run for, for six months. And uh, it's very much about bringing the National Library into the digital, or well, has been in the digital age as well, but sort of re showing how basically for, as a forum for digital storytelling and moving forward. But looking at the stories from place to space, and uh, Ian Taylor's animation that was used in the opening was, was very important. But the material I've shown you about Ptolemy, I don't know if you can read all that, but this is looking at Wellington. So it's sort of, if we start off with Ptolemy, and then we go to the concept of Terra Australis, so as we're moving from space to place, and we go through the thing, this is a wonderful map by Abel Tasman that had New Zealand as a little squiggle. The Australians will love this. It was just one line squiggle that you'd see from somewhere on their side of the Tasman as a coastline. And then you've got the Cook's map that you can see. And then we go all the way through to Wellington City Council and then we come up with a street address as almost the European sort of expression of place. Ian's animation, it showed on, he starts off with Tukori, which is nothingness. Then you have the light and day. And then you have you know, the people and you've got these sort of various steps. And in discussions with the Port Nicholson Trust, saying, where does it end? And they say, it ends with the stream. And so in, in Wellington, we're looking at the streams, but those streams are in the stormwater system. So then how do we start sort of telling their stories and bringing that out of the ground? And then we look at the digital Earth space to place. So you've got almost that photocopying the planet with you know, vast amounts of these technology that we've got out there and bring it all the way through to citizen sensors, and you know, there's our nano quadcopters again, but you're bringing it right down to, to effectively an IP address. But all of those are very valid as being places. And places are things that we can have emotion about. And again, with this uh, session that we had yesterday afternoon, the panel discussion, there was a lot of emotion that happens in the, in the software spaces and places. One of the things is when we look at our perception of place with our sensors, I mean, with our two eyes, and again, uh, Jules uh, spoke very well about this whole thing that sound is very much part of it. It's not just a visual experience, but we start looking at our senses. But it's quite pathetic, really, the bit that we've had to have in those 400,000 years or 200,000 years that we've evolved about sort of you know, really sort of the, the way that we look at the world around us. And we talk about hyperspectral, and you know, we've got bats with sonar and other things like that. But there's a, gam you know, a large gamut of, of, of information that's out there that we can now bring in with the digital Earth technologies and actually inform us. And so what I'd like to put forward to you is that basically technology is our super sense. It's always been our super sense since we invented fire. Well, we didn't invent it, but we applied fire. And also shelter and going all the way through. So think of technology as a super sense about where we're heading to. And again, the, the sound and for Jules, it's the, the ears in there. Um, it, it, it's that complete build upon it. And I've stolen this from Richard, but looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's a very good way to see it all. And again, how this technology applies at the physiological area, but also sort of taking right up to that whole self-esteem and again, sort of the whole enlightenment and other aspects is very important. And we've got to consider these together. It's about winning hearts and minds to actually bring it back into some of these other layers as well. So they work as an ecology together, going through at each different sort of stage. And this is a National Library sort of exhibition. It's, it's going to be a good example of that. Now, here's a sort of some thoughts as we get to place. Think of it as being where we intersect with all these different ecologies. So we've got these natural resources, and Tim was touching on those, but we've got these natural resources that are critical to place. And this is how a natural system would work, where we've got place, and it's bringing those sort of things together. And we have fire and other things like that that can utilise things, or we can have you know, eeling traps that can sort of be bringing in eels from the water and things like that. But we've got um, this, this sort of way of looking at place. Now the next step from this is if we take place and we sort of apply our technology and we look at sort of things like the urban water cycle. So, you know, to help sort of control flooding bits and pieces, we put our stormwater systems in place, we go and put sewerage systems in place, we go and put a water articulation in place and things like that. And these are great things and they've helped us and they've dealt with sort of, you know, you know uh, outbreaks of if influenza and various things in the past and it's, it's a good thing to have. But it's a very much a static way of looking at the world. It's not a necessarily a dynamic way of really understanding it as well. And so if we think about these sort of technologies being applied across there, it's almost like we've taken sort of that whole water cycle. So you look at the storage bit being in lakes and, and streams, and then putting that storage into dams and into water tanks, and then carrying through into these stormwater systems for water, and then bringing back into that ecology where you've got the precipitation or evaporation and precipitation, and then sort of the, the transportation things that, that takes place in these cycles. And so you've got these cycles taking place, but inside of place, we're, we're having that control of it with the way that we've always looked at technology in a very mechanised sort of way of, of seeing it. 
And so it's looking at these as, as twisted. But what you notice on this diagram, I've drawn it up so that you've got like an anti-clockwise twist that's taking place, a clockwise twist that's taking place in natural ecology, but we twist it around like a number eight and showing it as a clock, an anti-clockwise twist that we take place within the environment that we've reinvented these natural ecologies inside our own place. Now if we go to the next stage, and we'll sort of say, well, what's, what's the digital earth about? You know, I'd like to think it was about this, that we're bringing that place that we understand the world, we can co cognize the entire planet with all these technologies through these very vast amounts of sensory perception that we can bring into play and see this unified in that sort of way there. But there are some challenges with this. It's a very big challenge, not only with digital earth, but with the way that we look at things. And if we can look at this, this evolution, if you like, from natural place to mechanised place, and we then get to this, and if we think of this as a future with digital earth, but there is other ways that we can be looking at it. If we let the, the whole idea go forward with looking at how we mechanise things, we can then start looking at this as either, if you like, a, I'm just drawing it as an anti-clockwise sort of cycle, or it can become a clockwise cycle. So if we sort of say the answer to carbon dioxide's carbon sesquation, rather than getting that knowledge and understanding of things there, then we're going to go into that anti-clockwise sort of mode. It can help and sort of support things as well, but in terms of basically as an initiative for the planet, what direction are we going to go? Are we going to go to something that's going to be driven by knowledge, or is it going to be something that's going to be driven by sort of you know, mechanical know-how, if you like, and start sort of looking at things in those sort of ways? So, I mean, evolution by Darwin's terms was a very slow process. By Stephen Jay Gould's sort of terms, a neo-Darwinist was very much talking about evolution as dynamic and it's transformational. It's not transitional as it was in, in Darwin's sort of way of looking at a very slow transition. And he spoke about the idea of punctuated equilibrium. And certainly what we're seeing is a lot of punches as you go through Nick's, uh, the, Tim's sort of slides that he showed before the, the opening animation. There's a lot of you know, punctuation points that we're seeing in the history of humanity. When you look at this gentleman here, this is uh, Alexander Graham Bell, who was actually a speech therapist, but then he applied that and adapted it to invent the telephone. And if he came back to life from 18, you know, when he was around at the end of last set, or century before now, the 1800s, he would have picked up one of these and said, this is my invention. <laughs> it's a little bit different shape, but I invented this, and he'd be very, very you know, affirmative about this idea that he invented this. But we all know that if he suddenly saw sort of technologies that we have today, and this is an example from some of the work of Nextspace, and looking at sort of things that uh, Mark Billinghurst and others are doing that are here, you've got, you know, these are things that he invented too, at least he invented sort of the enabler, but it's almost like there's a meme, you know, this idea of an idea gene that's sort of gone through and it's been punctuated along the way, and he wouldn't necessarily say, well, this is what I invented, but it is, <laughs> or it's sort of seeded from that. And so there's a lot of ideas that sort of have this, these journeys that go forward. But also there's this innovation that sort of takes place with these ideas. So with Alexander Graham Bell enabling this invention, and again, it's thinking about digital earth as enabling things. You know, he came up with some amazing architecture. This you know, in the 1800s, looking at these, these towers that he built and things like that. I mean, this is out there. And then this, this kite. <laughs> I mean, just phenomenal things there. And one of the things we're going to see with digital earth is we've got this journey going forward as a project. There's going to be really exciting innovation that's going to be spawning off this thing. And just what Richard uh, McGeorge was talking about with Christchurch, could we make it just this project where it becomes this really innovative infrastructure for delivering of research and allowing other opportunities there? So think of Digital Earth as a knowledge place. And you know, again, sort of this, this journey into this, this knowledge place. It's an ecology of technology, policy, and digital content. And you know, it's looking at this whole data, becoming sort of the value chain of data, going from data to procedures to to models, to knowledge, to into patterns, and then back into metaphors. And metaphors are things that spark your neurons in your head to do actions that can go forward and sort of create further data. And we can start looking at some of the big challenges of digital earth and put it around there. So you've got aggregation, the collection of data, you've got the representation, and this, we're talking about evidential representation of data, so dealing with the provenance and dealing with the probabilistic modeling of certainty of that where that data is. There's all sorts of simulations that are going forward and allowing those to plug into it. The whole cognitive aspects, because one of the things when you move from a 2D world with maps and with lots of white space is pretty cool, when you suddenly go into 3D models, you've got to start populating the things that were once white space and have best guess at what it is and then start to re replace that as you get other information that's coming forward that's, that's more trustworthy of it. And so you've got Bayesian nets and evidence belief functions and various things that we could be putting in there, which are very, very exciting, you know, um, research areas. 
There's the dissemination and then back into the most important area, which is the people part. It's the socialisation. In fact, I was going to put the actuation there, taking a term from Carlos yesterday, but it is that. It's actuation and sense, and with the senses down there. But then when you look at this whole thing there, we've got, and see Liz March in here, but with ANSLIC and standards and protocols are very important, allowing the interoperability. Again, this is something that Simon Lloyd Evans is going to really be punching out, I'm sure, tomorrow in his talk. The other important thing is looking at these different ontologies, and I think Peter Woodgate introduced us to ontologies yesterday, but looking at the ways that we can express this data for the different types of purposes. If we're looking at economic modelling or social modelling, but we're, we're pulling the data from the common data sets and seeing how it can be applied, looking at the snap and span sort of uh, approaches to things. There's lots of domains, obviously, with digital earth. It's, it's exhaustive. But the other exciting thing, I think, is also looking at regulation and policy. And I think there's going to be excitement what's happening here with, uh, again, I keep plugging Simon Lloyd Evans, but what he'll be talking about with GeoBuild tomorrow, but looking at online consenting, but also bringing in demand side management and not just looking at demand side management for energy. We've got to have the carrot and stick type policies about bringing quality data sets that are going to come through this and allowing this quality data to go through and be pushing this as an ecology rather than just as a, a linear thing that just, like an arrow that just goes into the flesh. It's got to be an ecology that's alive and living and it's very much the, the nervous system for our planet that we're building. This is just uh, some work that we did in Melbourne, just showing sort of on the left there, this is with Next Space. Uh, this is looking at bringing LiDAR and some other data. We had hyperspectral and other sort of data sets generating sort of the Melbourne above the ground, below the ground. Below the ground, we started off with geomorphology and just algorithmically generated where the rocks were. Then we added bore the borehole data, so another level of truth. Then we added then sort of you know, ground penetrating radar and then starting to then observation. Things like that. So these new truths, just getting this knowledge of the rock underneath the ground closer and closer to the realities of what they're today. Then we could then slice and dice this into these little sort of bits for every individual parcel and show what each, each property looked like in 3D interactively. And then you can be generating from those for every individual property into a 3D PDF showing sort of how this thing could be installed, this pressure sewer system, or how it could be operated, or just communicating information there in a very you know, you know, simple way. Also looking below the ground where you've got the trees and you can be parametrically generating the roots, so looking at the probabilistic models of where the roots are and their impact with the infrastructure and rocks, which is obviously a very important thing there. But you know, there's, there's a very rich wealth of data, and this is a very you know, simple example of other things that can be done. Again, looking at this sort of the probabilistic modelling about where the rock is under every individual property. When they're rolling out the pressure sewer system, it's $60,000 if they strike rock and 2000 if they don't. So it's very important to know where the rock was. And they had this public-private partnership, so to give that transparency to that, so they could look at sort of the way that they'd be working with this TOC approach they took. Again, this is ground penetrating radar, bringing other sort of data into it. But uh, this is some of the work that Rachel's sitting here. And she's done some marvellous things. You have a look at her sort of presentations later on. But again, looking at cities in ways that you know, really make sense to us interactively that we can do today with big, big data sets. And then creating derivatives of those models for every individual property. And then you can be punching it out into a games engine, which we did here, and just put a fire scenario around the viaduct of Auckland. And so, it's, it's having things in a common forum that you can be sharing. And just looking at sort of, you know, again, digital earth is this very complicated ecology, but we can sort of be breaking it down in steps. If we go back to this diagram, I mean, the first thing is just starting to look at multiple feasibility prototypes. You know, just prototype. I mean, Carlo Ratti gave an excellent examples of what you can do with rapid prototyping. We should be rapid prototyping digital earth around some very good use cases and uh, then starting to bring that together. So getting these things done in a few months and just applying them and then getting that feedback and then we start bringing it into it. Quite often they'll be just sort of these point solutions but then bringing those together into a common forum. Then we should be taking those rapid prototypes into functional prototypes and starting to deal with that evidential sort of representation of the data sets. And so we have much more reuse of that data and it's, it's starting to bring in further disciplines into the management of those data sets. Then it's looking at then integrating these, these systems with, with simulation and other types of systems that the, we can that use to inform and, and bring as part of that whole sort of ecology. And then it's starting then getting into the more serious sort of science of it all and so looking at you know, volumetric and other types of data sets that we're starting to look at and uh, having ways that we can navigate into each one. So just sort of bringing that together, the top area there is very much about the citizenry and the socialisation, the access to this data, the openness of this data, it's very important. The bottom part is very much about science, and again, it's looking at publishing direct science into these models. 
So it is scientific, it's robust enough that you can be making decisions from the data that's there. And the middle part is about governance, and it's probably a, a very thin middle part that, that's there, but it's important to have these interoperability standards and it's important to bring in these, these policies that can direct things. And again, we should be looking at this as a, a knowledge accelerator. You, know, you can imagine this can becoming a, a major amplifier for knowledge to go forward. And again, looking at the cities as a starting point. So I just want to, just in the final steps, just talk some, about some work I was involved with at the Bioengineering Institute. So I worked with them for several years and was head of innovation. This is a group in Auckland. We had 130 researchers there. It's headed by an amazing fellow called Peter Hunter. Peter's the chair of computational physiology at Oxford, but also the director of the Bioengineering Institute at, at Auckland. He's a, a mar marvellous human being. He was going to be here to speak, actually, but uh, unfortunately he's, there's huge demands on his time. He's somewhere in Europe at the moment, uh, but... He spoke at the, the 2006 summit. But uh, their, their vision is to create their new human potential for looking at modelling, looking at drug discovery and drug testing, and again, sort of dealing with these big data sets. So it's really sort of where the, you've got the Human Genome Project was very much getting to the level of the protein, so it's looking at the base pairs of DNA. And, uh, and then when the Physiome Project starts off at the protein level, and goes all the way through. There's a few little other sort of sub-projects there, which are all quite significant, but the trans transcriptome and these other ones there, proteome, are ones that are dealing at that level and going forward. So it's looking at these steps. So it's very much like what Digital Earth is, if you think about it, but we're the next stage of that. Again, it's the same things. I mean, many of you are involved with the same things, you know, getting image data, segmenting image data, looking at computational meshes, and then getting these biophysical models where you're looking at the attenuation of current through tissues and, and various things. And we, we love sheep in this country, for those of you from the 20 nations that are out from here. But um, we did a lot of work looking at then applying this to looking at the sheep lungs. And then because of different gravity situations, you can see the sheep lung, but it's the human lung, applying a lot of the research that had been done there and bringing it back into the context uh, for research on humans. But also we're looking at breast and breast biomechanics and things like this and uh, bringing in sort of different modalities of imaging that was coming from mammograms and CT data, ultrasound, and bringing it back effectively into a zero gravity breast and then starting to then look at sort of how this data could be moved across the different types of uh, diagnostics that could take place and giving earlier detection about breast cancer. Now so, some of that work we're dealing with a lot of biomechanical modelling and things like that and uh, we're doing this with Oxford but uh, a guy called Mark Sager, who was with the Bioengineering Institute and with Weta Digital at this time, was the one who got two Nobel, uh, not Nobel, Oscars. <laughs> we gave him a hard time about this. <laughs> but he had Oscars for work on Avatar and other work that he's done subsequently on this. But it's again bringing that reality to, um, to the, you know, from that data there. So the work of the Bioengineering Institute was working with providing musculoskeletal models and looking at skin models that apply that area. So this is coming back a bit like what Alexandra Graham Bell was involved with. There are lots of spin-offs when you go on these journeys that you wouldn't anticipate. And uh, there's lots of awards there as well. But here yeah, you look at, compare the Human Genome Project with the Physiome with Digital Earth, and this really sort of positions it as a critical project. You've got you know, big challenges with spatial scale, and you've got big challenges with temporal scales. And then each one of those things, the scorecard on the Digital Earth becomes sort of quite, quite huge. So this is a project that's not only going to define the 21st century, it's going to define each one of us as it moves forward and how we see ourselves and how we see our place in the world. Again, looking at these three mega projects that are there on the cards is that you've got the same idea of publishing you know, XMLs and models into it, so getting that scientific research and getting this as, as research amplifiers and accelerating things. So, I mean, so often you've had researchers about different cities this is what's going to take planning out of the medieval era into as a modern science. This is some work that we played around with with this idea. I'm very interested in what Carlo Ratti was talking about on some of these CO2GO sort of projects. But this is looking at bringing a, a MRI data for a lung and putting it effectively into an iPhone, then wandering around the cities looking at uh, sensor webs, bringing looking at oxides of nitrogen and volatile hydrocarbons and other data sets to come forward. And then seeing that how it's dispersed across the city and then looking at risk modelling. So it's going to be enabling sort of social networks like people like me and places like mine as infrastructures that can be built upon these three, three big initiatives. And so it's enabling the miners' canary. In a sense, it's revisiting the past. It's also revisiting the past of what Ortalius did with his uh, theatrum, 
the first atlas, and again, this is again, we could describe digital earth as a comprehensive spatial and aspatial data sets. Interoperability is very important, things like that. The same challenges we face there, nothing's new. And again, it's, it's, it's digital earth could be 21st century cave art because it becomes a form of which we can express ourselves, tell our stories, and tell our future, and tell our past, and tell our, you know, whatever we want to be telling about how we, how we go forward. So here's a bit of a plug for the National Library. And uh, so 26th of November for six months. And if any of you got big data sets, we'd be loving to, we'd be very interested to talk to you about that. And there's a book that uh, Davina Jackson and I put together, which was for the working group, uh, the Digital Earth Working Group on the uh, Digital Cities. And it's freely available to anyone who wants it online. It's under dcitynetwork.net slash manifesto. So we've had a number of people here who've contributed to it. And uh, people also like Richard Dawkins and others have put their little says into it. And it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, an attempt to get a discussions moving forward on the digital city. So thank you very much.